to our youth visitors there. And uh, I hope the word of God to your heart will be a blessing. Our subject is a renewed people for a new earth. We shall pray and go straight into our message. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege of worship. We thank you for all of our visitors who have come. We pray that in the name of Jesus, you will bless them and bless us with your word. In these uncertain times, as the earth rushes on to its ultimate concision and destruction, we pray that you will enable us to be among the small group that will be saved in the end time. Bless your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible tells us that the world is sick and getting old. It is aging very rapidly. And this week, we had an example of the ongoing carnage. We started out with a train crash in Italy. These are the days of modern advanced technology. So nobody expects two trains to be on the same line at the same time. But it only shows something we'll talk about a little later on. And before we could catch our breath from that train crash, a man drove a truck at 70 miles per hour for two kilometers in a crowd of 30,000 human beings at Nice in France celebrating Bastille Day and killed 84. 25 are on life support, 25 very ill, and over another, another 150 still injured. And while we were getting a grips with that, there was a coup in Turkey, 60 dead, 700 arrested. The thing about the one in France is that with all the modern day security we talk about, this man was driving a truck, stopped by police, asked what was on the truck, what was his, was his purpose. He said he was going to deliver ice cream. The police did not check. The world is so tense that even at the University of Cambridge, there's a faculty for security. And the professor of counter espionage and, and insurgency and security was interviewed. And he was asked, well, people can do a PhD in this subject now. What is the whole purpose? He said, we cannot prevent these disasters. So what's the purpose of the faculty and the PhDs that can be done in security at the University of Cambridge? Only God knows. But the Apostle Peter tells us, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. 2 Peter chapter 3, 10 to 13. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the element shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons are ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Everybody can see? Looking for and hasten on to the coming of the day of God, the text continues, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the element shall melt with fervent heat. Look at verse 13. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now that's the key point. On this present earth, there is no righteousness. Blacks in America tell us there is no righteousness in the judicial system for them. Refugees pouring out of Syria by the hundreds of thousands meet no response in Europe of welcome or satisfaction. People ask, why Europe? Well, Europe was the continent in which Spain, then England, then France, then Portugal, and then the Netherlands colonized the whole world, exploited the whole world, took everything from the whole world, 
left the third world countries third. And now people from the third world countries going to the first world countries to get some of the sweets that were taken, they're told we don't want you. A woman in London said that after the Brexit vote, a man met her and said, go back to the third world, you piece of garbage. Go back to the third world dump. That's the world we live in. No righteousness. But God promises a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwell of righteousness. Now, this is the promise of God. Of course, people don't pay attention to the promise of God. People pay attention to the promise, promises of politicians. Although they have to change government after government because they know that the politicians' promises cannot be fulfilled, they change the governments, listen to the promise, change the governments, listen to the promise, until the Bible tells us the time will come when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And then the Apostle Paul in Hebrews tells us, Hebrews 1, 10 to 12, and thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth. Now, God did not make this world without righteousness. God made a perfect solar system and a perfect planet Earth in a perfect universe. There was righteousness on this planet and in this world when God first made it. The apostle goes on, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. Notice that. The heavens are not the works of an explosion. The heavens are not the works of chance. The heavens are the works of thine hands. And you know, the scientists, uh, the, the scientists who ought to know better, because what they teach you at O level and CXC and CAPE and first degree and second degree and PhD vanishes at the postdoctoral level. They tell you if you have gas in a vacuum, it will spread out and spread out and spread out and fill the whole vacuum. Yet these same scientists tell you, in the beginning there was gas after the explosion, and the gas compressed and compressed and compressed until you got matter. Utter rubbish. Against all the laws they teach. But the word of God says, the heavens are the work of thine hands. Not an explosion, not nonsensical science. Praise the Lord. And the word goes on. They shall perish. Why? After God made a perfect and righteous world, and by the way, God runs this universe by love and freedom. He has given freedom of choice. There was a decision on this planet to leave the government of God and to endorse and accept the government of another power that had already arisen before our planet was created. Before our planet was created, Lucifer had formed another political party in heaven called every man for himself. Selfishness. And he rebelled against God's principle of self-sacrificing love. The thing about this universe is that God runs this universe by infinite power, united to infinite wisdom and righteousness by infinite love. And that combination cannot fail. Nothing can go wrong in that combination. So when Adam voted out the government of God, that is what Adam voted out. And he voted out the government of God on a promise of the first politician in the universe. According to A.T. Jones, a great reformer, Satan was the first politician in the universe. And A.T. Jones defined a politician as a person who promised what he knew he could not deliver. And Lucifer promised Adam and Eve an exalted sphere of existence if they disobeyed God and obeyed him. The next morning after that vote, leaves were turning yellow. The earth was changing. Sin entered. Righteousness left. That was freedom of choice. So when people walk around blaming God for the carnage in the world today, they don't understand that all the problems in the world today are the result of bad, foolish, 
wrong, sinful, human, and demonic choices away from God's plan. God is not in the slightest to blame for any problem on this planet. All of the problems have come because we have chosen to depart from God's way, which way can never go wrong. So the apostle continues, there shall perish the heavens and the earth, no spoilt by sin, but thou remainest. And there shall wax old. If you have something that is old, very old, and beyond repair, you have to get a new one. You know that. But the Bible is telling us that this world now is beyond repair and old. So God is going to give us a new one. Praise the Lord. So verse 12, and as a vesture thou shalt fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. This is the only security we have, that we worship a God who is changeless in character, who does not fail, whose promises are sure, and who in fact has given us everything new because sin has made everything old. What a God. But you know, very few people believe this promise. The majority of people choose to believe. And the thing is, this has nothing to do with intelligence, you know. People of so-called low education are more prone to believe a true promise than high-class, sophisticated people with six and seven PhDs. Germany, Europe's brightest nation, the year is 1933. There's a man called Adolf Hitler. He tells the German people they were unfair in World War I. He's going to make them the best nation on the earth. He's going to take all the nations around. And when he's finished with them, they're going to conquer the world. And Germany, with the best scientists, the best educators, gave Hitler 94% a record in the world of the electoral vote and he was made chancellor. The rest is history. In two twos, we were in World War II. People believing the promise of a politician, not believing the promise of God. Isaiah tells us the reason, hope you can see this. Isaiah tells us the reason the land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord have spoken this word. And this word of the Lord is, God says, if you depart from my way, I have given you freedom of choice. I will warn you, invite you, and love you. But if you depart from my way, I cannot invade your freedom of choice. I will let you go if you do not want me. And the vast majority of people on the earth don't want God. You see how Satan has the world right now? If you call a church meeting, or if the school bell rings, and rain is falling, people can't get to school and can't get to church. For those listening on the internet, they had something the other day calling Barbados, Pan Pondy Sand. And rain was falling. And thousands of people gathered on Pan Pondy Sand to listen to rubbish drink rum, do what we call in Barbadian parlance, dance up, I can't use the other word in the public, and beat the showers to do that. So Satan has mankind hypnotized with entertainment. That is why the world is in recession. You know? People spend money for nothing. People go and a singer get on by the whole night saying rubbish and talking nonsense and makes millions of dollars that is spending money for nothing. If you are in a circuit and you break that circuit by spending something for nothing, the circuit is going to crash. In the circuit of beneficence, God's love gives all and all comes back to God and there's a circuit of life. We must have recessions in the world because rather than spend money on what is substantial, the Israelites in those days used to spend money for land and food. Nowadays, people are spending money for the win. 
And when the wind blows, the money is gone. There must be a recession. The money gone to the moon. So Satan has the whole world gone. People just run after music, sexual immorality, dancing, the, the various festivals in the Caribbean and around the world. There is no thought of God, no thought of responsibility, not, not even any, any thought of their own health. They eat as they like, drink as they like, fall down dead and blame a pipe. So we are in a serious position in the world. So the prophet Isaiah tells us what is happening. The earth mourneth, verse 4, and fadeth away. The world languisheth. And, but I tell you, everything is spiraling down. The haughty people of the earth do languish. And why is this? The earth is defiled. Notice verse 5. The earth is defiled. And defiled under what? Under the inhabitants thereof. The inhabitants have made choices that have defiled the world. Oh, yes. Our collective human choices. And we are not the only uh, uh, intelligent creatures on this planet. Apart from us humans, there are Satan's fallen angels living on this planet. Their choices and human choices against God's will have the earth under defilement. So the curse is upon the earth. The curse is not God pronouncing any bad word on the earth, you know. The curse is God saying, you don't want me. I love you. I have made you free. I cannot force your will. That would be a sin. I do not sin. I let you go. The Apostle Paul describes it in Romans 1. When people choose other than God's way, he gives them up to their choice. And look at what Isaiah goes on to say. He says here, look at it here. The earth also is defiled unto the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws. Watch it. Changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. You know, Things that not even the animals do, intelligent mankind is now doing and justifying it. Changing the ordinance, breaking the everlasting covenant, transgressing the laws. Even something like gender and sex. Now the California uh, state laws are saying you can't tell a child that his gender is male or female because it may be something else. So the whole world gone. Because God made, Jesus said God made them male and female. So we are in a mess. And when you tell people these things, of course they get vexed. When you tell people that there is an absolute morality, an absolute righteousness, Summarized in God's Ten Commandment moral law, which tells us what is right and what is wrong. And we come to Jesus Christ to receive righteousness so that we are enabled to live in harmony with God's righteousness. People laugh at that. People prefer to hear that we came here by an explosion called a Big Bang, which is utter nonsense. People prefer that. And then we lament that the world is getting worse and worse. And the prophet goes on, therefore have the curse before the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate, therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. And all this is the result of sin. Which means that uh, things are only now warming up in terms of getting bad. Things are going to get terribly bad. You know, uh, as one of our elders here who, who specializes in this area tells us, the atmosphere is now changing in composition. At school, we used to be taught that it was approximately 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. And the carbon dioxide concentration was 0.003%. I remember that from second form. But they say no. The carbon dioxide concentration is inching up. And carbon dioxide is such a heavy gas, CO2, that it, as it inches up and only a slight increase in concentration, it attracts a lot more heat as a molecule, changing 
the entire balance of the atmosphere. Floods in some areas, famine in other areas, terrible cyclones and hurricanes and storms. And you see all the atomic warfare that man talks about. When water and wind starts moving, no man can control them. They wash away the computers that they press and the buttons on. So, so we're in terrible trouble. Jesus now adds his voice. Listen to Jesus, Luke 21, 25, and 26. And there shall be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations, distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Wow. Talk about distress of nations. Even America. America goes about the world telling people about human rights. And right there in America, we want human rights. We want rights for minorities. And you know, America has a wonderful constitution. And it took very long for that constitution to recognize that black people were human beings. Perplexity. There's no safe place. A man said that when he... He was at the carnage there in France at Nice. And he said he saw people with their intestines squeezed out by the truck wheel as if when a car passes over a cat in the road. He saw a woman with her, her juggler and carotid blood vessels out through her neck, neck and she's screaming in the last moments of her life. And he said more terrible than that were the human beings alive around and the little children seeing it and hollering for the loved ones who were dead. He said it was a microcosm of hell. But Jesus says these are the beginning of sorrows because of sin, because of human choice away from God. I mean, I grew up, I was a little boy in the 1950s, and I never thought I would live today to see that I am not a marriage officer, that someday somebody will come and tell me I have to marry two men or two women. I want to lock me up, and I say no. I never thought that would happen. And as a matter of fact, in the 1950s, I thought things were bad. In the 1960s, in secondary school, I thought things were bad because you had Vietnam and Cambodia and those wars. But those are no Sunday school or Sabbath school. So what's happening now, what's happening now will be, will be kindergarten, so what is ahead? So Jesus continues, men's hearts filling them for fear. So don't ask why people are dropping down there. Jesus gives the answer. Distress, the fear, drinking alcohol, fretting all night. It is set some music. They don't even understand what the music's in. It is whole madness. Blood pressure rises. Their hearts fail and they drop down dead. Jesus gave the answer. Men's hearts fail in them for fear. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Sin is malignant. Sin is toxic. Sin destroys. And sin destroys by separating us from God's perfect way of righteousness and life. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 and 3, the Apostle Paul continues, For yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. A thief in the night. A thief in the night can surprise people or can be surprised. Because there was a man trying to get into his own house at midnight. His own house at midnight through a window. And he was dressed up in such a way that nobody would recognize him coming in to his own house at midnight. And he so cleverly disguised himself that not even his dog recognized him. He didn't get through the window. They had to call the ambulance for this strange in the yard mangled by a dog. When they took off his clothes, it, even the dog cried. Because the dog didn't recognize it was the owner. Even a thief. You know why he was coming in his house at midnight? He was in the wrong place and now trying to get home before his wife woke up. So Jesus says, 
For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. You know, all the technology that obstetrics and gynecology has, all the advanced medicine, you tell a woman when she's going to deliver that baby, it is the baby we now know that determines when it's going to come out. So the woman can never be sure from the doctor when the exact moment is. He may break down to a week. He may even approach the final two days. But the final moment is the baby's decision. So Jesus says, through the Apostle Paul, sudden destruction comes when we talk peace and safety. As a matter of fact, France had that place there in Nice without those 30,000 people celebrating Bastille. They had police all around, police all through Tremendous security. So what were the police telling the people? Peace and safety. I hear quite here in Barbados too for an upcoming festival. We're going to make sure it is absolutely safe. Which man can make sure anything is absolutely safe? Sudden destruction comes. So your only safety is to be in Christ. And Christ doesn't go those places. I don't care what anybody tells you. Christ doesn't go to Spring Garden. To doesn't go to Carnival. Doesn't go to any of those places. So you stay in Christ and you'll be safe. The prophet Daniel, Daniel 12.1. Daniel gets serious now. And at that time, shall Michael stand up. The great prince will stand up for the children of thy people. Watch it now. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And we have not yet reached that point. And things are what people are calling so bad. And we haven't reached that point yet. The prophet goes on. And at that time, hallelujah, thy people shall be delivered. You heard that? There will be deliverance for the people of God when the trouble reaches maximum intensity, which is still future. Not too far in the future, but still future. And I like this one. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. Is your name written in the book of life? It doesn't matter how much money you have, how many degrees you have, how much education you have. If your name is not written in the book, when that final trouble comes, and that final trouble cannot be imagined, it is nothing like these troubles here which we call very bad. If your name is not in the book, there is no deliverance for you because God can only deliver those who choose his government. Those who reject his government, he has to let them have the government of their choice. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 5 tells us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to, the, to his abundant mercy, hath what? Hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, after Adam voted out the government of God and voted in sin, God could have let the world go. But God is not like that. God is not like that. God is love. Hear what I said? Although God is infinite in power and infinite in wisdom, the most important characteristic about God is that God is infinite in love. And this love is unconditional. This love is eternal. This love is infinite. And this love is self-sacrificing. So God gives all to the other, none to self. And that's the only way to survive. You know what Self-sacrificing love gives all and gets all. Selfishness takes all and loses all. That is why selfishness is sin, is the root cause of sin, and that is why selfishness is destructive, self-destructive. But love cannot fail. Listen now to the rest of the text. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now, when Adam and Eve turned their backs on God, God did not turn his back on them. 
Praise the Lord. He did something that is almost unbelievable. He sent his eternal son, who was with him from all eternity, as God with him, to become a human being, and that is worse than a human being choosing to be a cockroach. Nobody in here, well, not the women. Certainly not my wife. Last night sleeping, I felt something crawling on me, so I got up and shook it off. And my wife normally sleeps soundly. So if I get up to go walking, she doesn't hear that I gone. When I come back, she knows. But somehow, even when she's sleeping, she knows if a cockroach is in the bedroom. <laughs> Wherever I am in the house, she calls me to kill cockroaches. So imagine a human being becoming a cockroach to save cockroaches. Save a cockroach? But the Son of God became a human being. By that time, we were not only nothing, but less than nothing because of sin. And God sent his son to become a human being and take on the very flesh we have that was already damaged by sin and a source of trouble. To be tempted in all points like as we are and yet overcome all temptation and live a sinless, perfect life maturing a righteousness against every satanic attack. And if that wasn't enough, then he took all of our sins upon himself and suffered the separation from God which our collective human sin causes and endured that agony while still alive. And that agony is infinite. I tell you, we cannot appreciate what Jesus went through to save us. He suffered the agony of complete separation from God, the agony of eternal death, in order to reconnect us to his Father. And you know what that did? That canceled our guilt. The Bible tells us in another passage, because when I was preparing these texts, I was going to add a lot more texts, but I know that time will be limited, especially on a youth visitor's day. And my wife told me, you can't explain everything in half an hour, which is true, but I can explain this one. When we were without, without any hope, any hope at all, when all was washed up and gone, Jesus Christ came to our rescue. And by taking our collective human guilt, he canceled our condemnation. The Bible tells us that God did not impute our sins to us, but he put them on his son, and his son suffered the agony. This world is so selfish. All of us are born hopelessly selfish. That is why we need to be renewed. But before we come to that, let's look at a few other points. First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, for the Lord himself shall descend. So as the earth appoints, it approaches its end point, and there's a great time of trouble ahead, ultimately, this is what is going to happen. Jesus is going to come again. Praise the Lord. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Praise the Lord. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is the end point for the people of God. For those who are not of God, the end point is totally different. The end point ultimately is destruction. A destruction not caused by God, but caused by their own choice of sin, separating them from God. So Jesus is coming again. And Revelation 26 tells us, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. So when Jesus comes, he's going to resurrect to eternal life and immortality all those who died in Christ. And he's going to change. You see, there's going to be a remnant 
that remnant we talk about whose names will be in the book of life, people alive on God's side, rejecting all the world, all its folly, all its music, all its immorality, all its alcohol, all its drugs, all its selfishness, all its sin, they haven't been saved, their names in the book of life, they will be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. And the basis of their salvation would have been what Christ did for them at Calvary's cross. They will not talk about what they have done. As a matter of fact, when Jesus tells them, you visited me in prison and you visited me when I was sick, they will say, no, we don't know anything about that. They will not be thinking of their performance. They'll be thinking only of what God did for them. Their performance will be 100%, but they will not think about it. They will think only about Jesus Christ and what he did for them. And they will live and reign with Christ a thousand years as the thousand year millennium before the earth is made new. So Revelation 21, 1, 4 and 5 tells us, let's read it together. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And God shall do what? Wipe away all tears. You can, you can imagine the people out there crying, still crying. We had a number of air crashes recently in which uh, there was terrorism or human error, uh, and people are still crying. Look at what it says. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. You hear that? No more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write. Look at what God is saying. These words are what? True and faithful. Which politician can tell you so? Not one. But God says these words are true and faithful. Will you believe God? Or believe the foolishness of man? Or even believe yourself? You can't even believe yourself. You have to believe God. So we come to this important point now. If there is going to be coming a new earth after the great time of trouble, and don't forget, this trouble we see in the world now is nothing compared to the trouble still to come. But in that time of trouble, if your name is in the book of life, you are secure. Nicodemus was a big shot. Had a PhD at the feet of Gamaliel. So, a big shot he was. He didn't want anybody to see him going to Jesus in daylight. So he went to Jesus at midnight. And he went to Jesus with a whole set of fancy talk. And Jesus said, don't mind all the long talk, Nicodemus. Jesus answered and said unto him, let's read it. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see. The kingdom of God on verse 5, Jesus answered again, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You see, you know the other day, you know uh, there's now a spaceship orbiting uh, Jupiter. Jupiter is a, a huge planet, massive. I was listening to the BBC, com BBC commentator saying, they hope as this spaceship orbits, and it's very close, that they get enough information to tell them how the solar system was formed. If you're such rubbish, that costs millions of other people all about the world starving, want food, that costs billions of dollars to send it up there to find out how the solar system was formed. When it comes back, it can't tell them one thing. And without a cent, you can open the Bible to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Talk about foolishness in this world. So, they say that Jupiter is so uh, vast and so dense. Gravity up there is tremendous. That it will teach them some lessons. And they hope then to be able to plan spacecraft trips to the solar system in times of danger on earth. You scientists, even the scientists realize that this planet is in trouble, you know. The earth is growing old and can no longer sustain the human population. Water is running out. People from St. Joseph will tell you that. Water is running out. Food is running out. Everything is spoiling. 
So guess what? You can get a spaceship to the space station to spend a vacation, and a ticket will cost you $60 million. Now, that, that's not only beyond the average man, that's even beyond the average rich man. Only the richest of the rich can think about buying a ticket for $60 million to go to the space center. And they say when they colonize Mars, tickets can go up to a billion dollars a ticket. So it is clear, it is clear that going through space to a new world is very expensive. So going through space to heaven, the cost is infinite. We're, we're if, going, if going yonder to the space center is 60 million, and going to Mars when they say they colonize it, what madness, is a billion, going to heaven, got to be infinite. But the price has been paid, hallelujah, by Jesus Christ. The price has been paid by Jesus Christ. So you're going to borrow the money from Bill Gates. Jesus has given you the ticket. Praise the Lord. The price has been paid. Listen to what the Bible tells us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 and 10. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Don't let anybody fool you. God has not appointed any human being to wrath. From the beginning, God wanted everybody saved. But he has made us with freedom of choice. Listen to what the word of God says. For God hath not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation by the Lord Jesus Christ. So God wants everybody to be saved. God is not responsible for anybody being lost. God is not the cause of wrath. Wrath is separation from God by sin. He's not appointed us to wrath. Hallelujah. He's appointed us to obtain salvation by the Lord Jesus Christ. Who died for us. That whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Praise the Lord. That death of Jesus on the cross. He paid the redemption price for every soul. He canceled our guilt. That's the good news. We have been legally pardoned already. And when we believe that good news and give ourselves to him, a radical change takes place in our thinking. That is called the new birth. Love controls us instead of selfishness. We are born again and changed from being rebellious and disobedient into submissive and obedient to the commandments and to the word of God. You can imagine that even this world now with all its problems, suppose right now you could get everybody in the world, everybody, including ISIS, keeping the Ten Commandments. You can walk down at midnight. Women can walk down the world at midnight. Nobody would rape them. You can sleep with your windows open. Nobody will steal anything. So even this miserable world, if right now you could get everybody changed to love and obedient to God by that love, it would still be a half a paradise. So you see, the problem with the world is not the world, it's the people in the world. And they need to be changed. And Jesus died to effect that change. Praise the Lord. So Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 tells us, for by grace are ye saved through faith. I tell you something, all it takes is faith. It doesn't take any $60 million ticket. Jesus has paid the price. All you have to do is believe. And any and everybody can believe. Praise the Lord. The rich can believe, the poor can believe, the uneducated can believe. As a matter of fact, the uneducated tend to believe truth better than the educated. By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, at many funeral services I hear, he did this and did the nets. And he did so much for the poor and he did this. Well, let me tell you something. None of that has anything to do with getting into heaven, you know. Not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. If it was worse, we would boast. I did more than you. I visited more people than you all as boasting. But it is a gift. Jesus has done it all. And when Jesus transforms us and we do anything, we will not even think about it. Because it is all Christ. And then verse 10. Look at the transformation. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So when we are born again because of faith in Jesus Christ, and we are saved entirely by what Christ has done for us, there's a radical change that makes us 
good. In fact, the righteousness of Christ comes into our hearts and we become the righteousness of God in Christ. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Revelation 22, 17 to 20 tells us, as we come towards the end, let's look at the invitation. Now, I can tell you something. Sometimes looking at these pictures of people crying and so on, tears come to my eyes. Now, if a sinner like me can feel the pain of a woman there on the BBC, when you turn to the pictures, hollering a French woman, her child was one that the truck wheel crushed its head. Her ten children went in the 84. And she there hollering. How does God feel? God feels all this pain and all this agony. When a sparrow falls to the ground, we don't think anything about it. Jesus says that his father feels the agony. And people ask, why, if God feels the pain, why doesn't he do something about it? He's done everything about it. Everything about it. But he cannot interfere with freedom of choice. An atheist arguing with me, the other day said, why doesn't God do something about it? I said, why doesn't God shut up your mouth from saying there is no God? I'm free. I said, that's it. Everybody's free. Freedom of choice. So the experiment of sin will run its course. Eventually, everybody's mind will be made up. The vast majority for sin and selfishness and the devil. A small minority for God's love. And then God will give each group its choice. Those who don't want God, God will give them up. When God gives you up, I tell you something, don't begin to talk. When God gives you up, only God can maintain life. When God gives you up, there is utter destruction. And those who choose God will get God. You know what God told Abraham? Don't worry about the land of Canaan. I promise you, I am your exceeding great reward. When we choose God, we get God. It's not just the new Jerusalem. It's not just the earth made new. It is God that we're getting. God! Praise the Lord. So this is the invitation. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that hear of say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. You can take the water of life freely today. Whether you're young or old. And of course Satan comes after our young people. Gets them taken up. And they, they know the world is so foolish now. They tell me I heard it the other day. That this thing called Nintendo. I, I, I can't even spell it. It's too high for me. Nintendo. They create a new version of it now. And already have made a billion dollars. You see where the money going? See, we're many, we're going pure foolishness. And people, two people went, went in a man yard trying to get, the, and told them to get locked up a white man, a black man, or a white woman going, trying to steal this thing. But tell you something, I don't know. As the angels look down, as God looks down, well, 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 what a world. And Satan comes after the young people with all these foolish games, all this entertainment, tells them, don't mind church and the sermon too long and the church boring. I have something sweet for you. It's our snake in the cuckoo. And this time the fish will not wink. So the spirit and the bride say, come and take the water of life freely. He which testify these things, saith, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. Praise the Lord. Now I have a closing gem. And this is youth visitors there. This is for the youth. And anything for the youth is for everybody else. Because since the youth asked me to preach, I am therefore an honorary youth today. This is for everybody. Because I thought they were chosen a, a young person. So listen to this as we close on this solemn note. Know ye not that you are not your own. Young people, you are not your own. You are not your own to smoke drugs and drink alcohol and go fetting all night and disobey your parents and do you want. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. First Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. You've been bought with a price. Listen to it now as we close. All men have been bought with this infinite price. Praise the Lord, all men. By pouring the whole treasury of heaven into this world, by giving us in Christ all heaven, God has purchased the will, 
the affections, the mind, the soul of every human being. Jesus has paid the redemption price for everybody. I don't think you are too young not to understand because you say you're too young to follow the word of God, but you're going to follow rubbish. That is sometimes more difficult to understand than the statement, Jesus loves you. He died for you. Come and follow him. Whether believers or unbelievers, all men are the Lord's property. You heard that? We're the Lord's property already. You don't have to do anything for Jesus to pay the price for you. He paid the price for you before you were born. He's done it all. We are his by creation and by redemption. Our very bodies are not our own to treat as we please, to cripple by bad habits that lead to decay, making it impossible to render to God perfect service. Our lives and all our faculties belong to him. He is caring for us every moment. You hear that? But let me tell you something. Your heart cannot keep beating at 70 beats per minute. But I can't say 70 because young people nowadays, when they come into the clinic and check their pulse, they're going at 90 because they don't sleep when they night come. And they don't eat good food. They want macaroni pie and chips and all sorts of things. But they eat some good yam and potatoes and ground provisions. So you've got to carry your body. But every heartbeat is electrical. And scientists in their research have been looking at what starts the heartbeat in the sino-atrial node in the right atrium. For years they've been doing research. And they say they're no closer to understanding the mystery of life. Scientists can make DNA in a test tube, but still scientists can't make life. So it isn't that your heart just beats automatically. The grace of God, because of the sacrifice of Christ and his intercession in heaven, is what keeps us alive. We are alive by the mercy of God. But we can choose to reject that mercy and destroy our bodies. All death is the result of sin. So it goes on. Our lives and all our faculties belong to him. He's caring for us every moment. He keeps the living machinery in action. If we were left to run it for one moment, we should die. You heard that? If God were to leave us to run this, bi this biochemistry and this physiology and this anatomy for one minute, we'd be dead. Every morning you wake up, understand that you wake up and you're alive because of God's love and God's mercy and because Jesus died for you. You're not your own. We are absolutely dependent upon God. A great lesson is to be learned when we understand our relation to God and his relation to us. The words, you are not your own, you are bought with a price, should be hung in memory's hall that we may ever recognize God's right to our talents, our property, and our influence, and our individual selves. We are to learn how to treat this gift of God in mind, in soul, in body, that as Christ purchased possession, we may do him helpful, savory service. The wealth of earth dwindles into insignificance when compared with the worth of a single soul. You heard that? The worth of a single soul for whom our Lord and Master died. He who weigheth the hills in scales and the mountains in a balance regards a human soul as of infinite value. Now because God loves you and values your soul, Jesus came and died for you. Let the youth, young people, let the youth be impressed with the thought that they are not their own. They belong to Christ. They are the purchase of his blood, the claim of his love. They live because he keeps them by his power. Their time, their strength, their capabilities are his to be developed, to be trained, to be used for him. Christ has bought you at a dear price and offers you grace and glory if you will receive it. Young people, as we are about to sing our closing hymn, I want you to understand that this is a very serious time for youth and for everybody. The world is not going to get any better. And Satan has already 
addicted many young people to rubbish. Whether it is alcohol, illicit sex, foolish music that is so loud it will deafen you, and you can't understand what the people are saying. Wasting time at night in these crowded places of entertainment. And the thing is now, in these crowded places of entertainment, anybody can start shooting a while, you're gone. And Satan wants to lull you asleep. It is as if you are in a building playing dominoes, and the building is on fire, and you're taken up with a foolish game, and don't try to get out. All Satan wants to do with you is to occupy you with rubbish because the world is rushing on to its end and if you don't take stock, you will be destroyed. But the spirit and the bride say come. To God be the glory is our closing hymn and as we sing this closing hymn, young people wherever you are, whether you're in church or in the world, the important thing is to be in Christ because a lot of young people in church not in Christ. So I want you to be in Christ today. I want you to come and commit your lives to Jesus Christ. He paid an infinite price for you. I am sure all the thought you put down, you wouldn't feel any big set of pain for a friend. Jesus felt infinite agony for your soul and paid the price for you. And all he wants you to do is to give yourself to him and be born again and live for him. Cut away from the rubbish of the world which will only destroy you and come to Jesus Christ. And accept him as your Savior and Lord. And be changed from being disobedient to being a keeper of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. As we sing this hymn, to God be the glory, you can make that decision to give your life to Jesus Christ. We ask the singing, the praise group to come and lead us in this hymn, to God be the glory. God be the glory, great things he have done, so left he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life in that Before, before we sing the next stanza, before we sing the next stanza, uh, these are terrible times. <laughs> terrible times indeed. And God does not want you to be afraid of him, but understand that sin is a terrible thing. <clears throat> and Satan wants to get as many people dead before they choose Christ 
so that in the final judgment, he has a lot of people going into the second death. There is nothing more important for you than while alive, choosing Jesus Christ and committing your life to him completely. He has done it all for you. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. If he gave his son, you can give your son, you can give yourself to the son. Next stanza, and come to Jesus as you are. To God be the glory, it is the earth. To every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, to Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great or rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but pure and higher and greater will be all oh, wonder or gladness when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Just before we pray and commit or we commit our lives to Jesus Christ, there are individuals who like to put off God. If somebody calls them to go to a fet or to go to rubbish, they get ready yesterday. But when the call comes to commit to Jesus Christ, they justify staying away from Christ. They think they have time put down. And so I am mindful that before we sing the chorus, one more time, and the Holy Spirit is pleading and convincing and convicting those who have not given their hearts to the Son of God who paid an infinite price for that heart to do so today. You see, delay means that Satan will keep you in his snare. Making a commitment means that you have the Spirit on your side to increase his pleading. Do not say like King Agrippa, come another time and I will hear you. The Bible says today is the accepted time. If you hear the voice of God, harden not your heart. Let's say the chorus one more time. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, to Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Well, let us humbly kneel as we pray to God, commit our lives to him. 
And even if you have not come forward in your seat and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, can do it in your seat. Give your heart to Jesus who paid the redemption price for your soul. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ who came into this world, showed us how to live the perfect life, and then died the death that we should die to give us eternal life. The world is getting worse and worse. Soon there will be no safe place. And trouble more terrible than we can imagine is up ahead. In the mark of the beast crisis and the great time of trouble, there will be unspeakable, unimaginable terror. And ultimately your true people will be persecuted and sentenced to death. But you will have a remnant who will stand for the right even though the heavens may fall. Though the vast majority will allow Satan with foolish music, alcohol, drugs, entertainment, and all sorts of nonsense occupy their minds, you will have a people who will stand firm to God's government as the needle to the pole. Have mercy upon us. Those of us at this altar and those in the seats who have made a commitment, we pray that you would take our hearts Take our minds, take our will, take our affections, take our intellect. You paid the price. We give ourselves to you. We thank you for the legal pardon given at Calvary. We accept it. Give us the forgiveness now of 1 John 1, 9, which takes sin away from us and imparts your righteousness into our souls to make us lovingly and willingly obedient to your will not as the cause of our salvation, but as the fruit of a salvation freely worked out and given in Jesus Christ. Bless us for the rest of this day. Bless all the visitors who came. Grant that your word which has gone forth in the Holy Spirit will remain in their minds. And that we will make our calling and election sure before it is too late. Have mercy upon us. Forgive us convert us, transform us. May we set our priorities straight. May we start reading your word and studying Bible truth and praying to you and serving you and come away from all the nonsense of the world which the world calls pleasure but which is destructive poison. Save us from ourselves. Save us from the world. Save us from sin. Save us from the devil. Bring us into yourself. Have mercy upon us. We thank you for hearing and answer an opera through Jesus Christ, our Lord, with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen and amen. May the Lord bless you. And may you definitely seek to abide in Christ. It asks.